Hi, my name is Tracy Richardson. This is our first time at the IMC conference as a closing keynote. We're very excited to, to be part of this. Lots of activity we've seen going on this week around many different uh, genres and su subjects. It's uh, very exciting to, to be part of it. So we're glad to share our story and our time uh, from Toyota going all the way back to 1988 uh, when we get to, got to learn from our Japanese trainers uh, from Japan. It was a very, uh, very exciting time for us and we were very blessed to, to be at the right place at the right time when Toyota decided to build the plant in uh, Georgetown, Kentucky. Hello, my name is Ernie Richardson, uh, 25 years at Toyota. I started in manufacturing, working on axles uh, and, and worked my way up through the organization and had responsibility for skilled trades maintenance for a while also safety for our plant in Kentucky, and also finished my career in, in medical management. So think about a career path where you start in manufacturing, go through maintenance, and end up in, in operations and medical. So that's pretty cool. So in 1986, they actually broke ground and said they were going to build the first owned Toyota plant in Georgetown, Kentucky. So I had just uh, graduated from high school. I'm dating myself a little bit there. So I put in for the testing. It was about a year and a half of an onboarding process. Then they were looking for, for certain competencies in their people, so they were able to mold us. So I spent time doing that. I got hired on in the plastics department August of 1988. I was actually a team member on the line. And at Toyota, we have internally the University of Toyota and the Toyota Institute. So I went to school to learn to be a leader. And you have to have a, a certain amount of prereqs. So I spent three years as a team member online, going to school to learn to be a first level supervisor. Spent five years as a team leader in plastics and in various roles within a bumper molding, instrument panel. And then I went to school to be a first level management. So I spent my first 10 years going from hourly to salary from 88 to 98, uh, doing a lot of coursework around a lot of the subjects that we have talked about here at the conference. And then in 1998, I transitioned into human resources training and development for Toyota as a contractor. So I actually went from production into HR as a contractor, spent several years as we grew as Toyota across North America. I got to spend a lot of time teaching problem solving, visual management, A3, kind of Hoshin strategy, the things around reliability with just developing people and the culture around that. And then around the early 2000s, I started getting an external pool to, can you teach this Toyota stuff externally? So I said, sure. So I had a really good time transitioning to say, you know what, it's really not about making cars. It's about developing people. So we like to think at Toyota, at the time we were there, we were a company that first developed people that just happened to make cars. And so that was kind of the, the people first mentality that really has taken me across the last 32 years of my career with many hats on. Also uh, started in 1988 with, uh, with Toyota, started as production team leader. Uh, worked my way up to the organization on, in, in the powertrain side. Uh, then I transitioned over to human resources. Uh, it was a big change to go from manufacturing to human resources from a defined process to where processes are not as clear. And so it's the, the techniques I was taught in the manufacturing area become very important to be able to, to perform my job in non-production areas. Uh, I worked in skill trades development for a while for Toyota, but also transitioned into plant safety for our plant there in Kentucky, which had about 8,000 employees at the time. Uh, then I worked in the medical side and then transitioned into corporate medical for about the last seven years as operations medical director for Toyota. The key thing is, as I'm going through the career, we're starting on culture on day one. I, went to, I had the opportunity to go to Japan several times, and they were teaching me about culture the first time I went to Japan. 25 years later, the day I'm leaving, we're still working on culture. So it's not a journey, it's a, des it's a, it's a journey, not a destination, absolutely. So we had a lot of questions from external folks. What was it like to work at Toyota? What was the culture? How do you explain the culture? It was a lot of things around the cultural infrastructure that Toyota had created. And a lot of times, Ernie and I just you know, pretty much thought about it as the thinking behind the process, right? The thinking behind the culture. And we thought, you know, there's a way maybe we can write down what was very atmospheric inside of the Toyota plants. And so we came up with the Toyota Engage 
engagement equation. And the equation is kind of the middle parts of the book from chapter four to about chapter 10, going through what we kind of Ernie and tracy in a way to kind of say, here is how you can replicate the cultural infrastructure from a people side, from a process side, from a purpose side and problem solving, looking at those four Ps. Here's how you can recreate this in any genre of industry. You know, people think, oh, it's about manufacturing. You know, we have a, a service type uh, picture on there because it works. As long as you have those four Ps, you're looking at what processes create the outputs. And this equation gives you a roadmap or a flow chart, or it kind of looks like a math equation. People like processes. And so it's a process to recreate the culture if the ending of it is DNA, if you have the discipline and accountability. So the first part of the book goes through some of the hiring process. What was Toyota looking for in employees, the, the competencies, and how were they kind of futuristically thinking this person can be a leader in five to 10 to 15 years from now? And I think that was very uh, forward thinking to say, I'm going to hire me. I came in at 19. I left as a sophomore in college to, to start my career at Toyota and to say, wow, you know, they see me as a potential leader. What was I showing? And so we talk about that onboarding and how that, that transition into the culture and uh, the end of the book really is about leadership, sustainability, how you sustain this in various types of culture, uh, personal stories of uh, Ernie in Japan and, and just the transition of learning. And we kind of say you really walk along with us on our Gimba journey of learning of the past 32 years. We want to feel like you're walking with us. And so you can add to that. And, and, and also in the book, we, we want the book to be more of a workbook, not just a book you read and put on the shelf. We love to go to clients when we open it up, there's handwritten notes in it, there's sticky notes in it, there's all kinds of things where they're looking at different parts. And so we, when, we, when we wrote the book, we kind of, we put a case study in there so we can help people understand how to go through the transition pieces. Not just read the book and try to figure it out, but the case study helps lead us through. Then the last part, Tracy talked about leadership standardized work. What's the, what's the importance of leaders and does, does leaders really have standards they have to follow? And what we explain to people is absolutely, because they're setting the culture. If you, you can really have a culture, but if you have a leader that has a really negative culture, it's gonna be, be a challenge. And so we talk about what's the leader standardized work, the leader roles and responsibilities, the, lead, the leader's responsibility to be a servant leader. And how do, what does that mean when I've gotta develop somebody to be better than me? And so we gotta have that mentality, so we talk about that. And at the very end of the book, we even talk about how standardization plays a role in our own lives. So we, we use an example when a hurricane's coming through of how important standards was in, in, in our life. Uh, we were at a client and, and, and we had to have standards for somebody to help us uh, prepare our home for the hurricane to come through. And without the standards, I'm not sure we'd have done that. So for Toyota, I think that, uh, you know, my experience at Toyota, I kind of went through this actually uh, even when I was there, let's take and I left in 2013, we already saw that trend. But what we started looking at is what's the, what's the needs of the person, the new, newer generations, I'll put it that way. What's the needs they want? Because they're different than the people that started in 1988. Uh, and the culture's different. And so we, ha it, it doesn't make it right or wrong, but we have to adjust our company to meet the needs of the people, to make them want to work there, right? And so we have to be able to look at things a little bit differently. It can't be just in the shoebox and never get out of the shoebox. It's got to say, okay, what's the new shoebox? Because it's different because people are, are demanding, demanding different things if you want them to come work for you. And so I think Toyota's done a really good job uh, before I left and even since I left of being able to meet the needs of the people coming in. And so far, by doing that, and, and you can read a lot of the things they do from process perspective related to uh, retirements, related to benefits, all these other factors to be able to draw that, that group of people in. Now, the unique thing is if we can get them in the door, we got them because we'll direct it. They can go whatever career path they want at that point. So the company will support and direct them to whatever career path they want. They might start putting, putting cars together, but they may end up being a data analysis in, in, the, in the computer world somewhere. So, so there's, there's definitely career paths for them. Once we get them in the door and, and direct them, I think it's, and, and so 
The benefit is word of mouth to each other is the biggest impact. So they start talking, hey, we can do this at Toyota. So I think it's, it's huge. So I, th I, don't, I don't sense that's a bigger problem at Toyota as I see at other places that I go to because, you know, uh, they're not willing to move the needles to where the requirements for the new folks are. I think some to, to add to that, I think when you look at the technology today and, and you know, back in 1988, we weren't taking pictures with phones and integrating them into our standardized yeah. work charts. You know, today things are a lot easier. So, so the tech evolution for a lot of the things that we did in what I call the Neanderthal days by pencil, even though I think they still like us to use the pencil with the charts and, and handwrite, but the work-life balance is, is a very important important for some folks uh, that are raising families. In some of the roles at Toyota, they look at a certain percentage of time that you may be able to do some home style of work. Now, obviously, when you're on the line, that's a little bit difficult to do, but they, they always, one of the values at Toyota is to challenge people, and, and that's in every aspect of your job yourself. So you want to look at how can you look at the, the challenge part of in my individual IDP, my individual development needs, when I'm looking at what are the things I need to work on? So I was very introverted when I went into Toyota and they worked on that with me. And so they really take your strengths and they raise the bar and they look at the developmental areas and what do you want to do? They'll ask you, what do you want to do a year from now, three years from now, five years from now? They're always asking you questions. They're very interested in how you think. And I think being people centric in that way uh, allows for the newer generation to express, you know, how they feel they, you know, would like to work and see a workplace go. And I feel Toyota listens pretty good in that area. And I'll just add one other comment on the end of Toyota trusts to really build vehicles that, that, uh, that attract all levels. So if you look at new Camrys with all the gadgets and all the, the bird's eye view and all that, you know, that also is a draw that people want, hey, I want to go work for a company that does that. And so I think it's, uh, it's, it's really a holistic approach. And, and I promise you, with my time at HR, we're always, they're always looking at what's the next step? What's the next step? It's never good enough. You know, what's the next step? What's the next step? What are we missing? And we're always trying to figure out, we always talk about if you don't have a problem, that's the biggest problem at all, right? So we create our own problems. <laughs> So I'm a, a big poster or a sharer of wisdom, I call myself, on LinkedIn. And so I'm always sharing my own wisdom through, through my years uh, at Toyota and externally. You know, we learned that from Mr. Cho, our president at, at, at TMMK. He always said, as leaders, we had to study harder and we should always be sharing our wisdom with the next generation. And so I learned that from him in the sense of, uh, I've got to share the information. You know, he would bring our competitors in the plant. GM would be in there, Ford would be in there. And everybody was like, why is our competition right here looking at everything we did? And, and you know, he said, from a cultural perspective, it's very hard to replicate what this is happening. So I will show all the secrets because it's very hard to replicate the culture. And so I share a lot of those stories from a cultural perspective and just from the things that, that I learned on LinkedIn. And so I met Mara and Terrence there and we started to have a conversation about, hey, would you like to come and share some of your wisdom? at the conference and we were like absolutely this would be our first exposure to work with the IMC and it would be a great opportunity to be able to talk in front of a different group of people and, and just share so that's one of the ways that we were able to share and I was like you know we've never done that specific you know I'm thinking total maintenance you know when we go in and, and start talking about the people side of thing the cultural side of things I'm like are we a, a good fit you know are we gonna fit into this and the more we started talking we talked with Terrence we had a few conference calls with Terrence and Mara and and you know we said you know this this would just be a one a challenging uh, opportunity for us to be in something that's totally different than what we've been used to and also also to be able to share 
as as I said, a different perspective. I think you know, listening to Terrence today, uh, I think we're all talking about very similar things. We just may frame it a little bit differently from the people side of it. But I think the outcomes are are out there as a a, a guiding beacon for us all. And so we said, yeah. I said, who can pass up? We live in Florida, but who can pass up South Florida in December for warm weather? The the great venue and just being able to get uh, to be a part of for the very first time uh, the IMC. Yeah, and I think uh, for me it was pretty exciting because having been involved in maintenance a little bit at Toyota, I, I didn't even know this conference existed. And now to see this and go, man, this is so needed yeah. in, in, in wherever we go. And so now we've got a reference. You've got to go to the IMC, man, if you've got to learn about this part of it. But, but you know, it's, it's a unique group of folks in the fact that they have a very analytical mind and they, they really do want problem fixed. And so what we're trying to say is, yeah, we, we'll give you, everybody's got the tools, but we want to give you how to build a culture. And, and the culture part in, is what, you know, I think in listening to the presentations today, it's, as Tracy said, it's kind of the same thing we're talking about. So I know Tracy had some concerns early on about do we fit in? And I said, you know, my experience says we fit totally in because it's about the, the thinking. And, and, and so I think we're going to have a good time. So we look forward to it. So I think uh, I'll, I'll kind of start, but I think if the thing we can leave the practitioners with is understanding that culture is a constant battle. It's every single day. So every single day, you know, as leaders, we, we change the culture just by how we dress or how we look. Not just what we say, it can be anything. If I walk by and don't say hello to you because I did every day but today, then that, that can change the culture that much today. And so what we talk about in servant leadership is I always got to go to the person and say, what do I need to do for that person to be able to be continue to develop? We always use the analogy at Toyota to say, we, we take your, your, your performance and we stretch your rubber band for development. Then we give you time or space to think, you ease up on the rubber band, then we stretch it again. And we keep stretching that rubber band to take your performance at a higher level, meanwhile uh, helping you understand why the culture is very, very important. So servant leadership is very hard, particularly if we get very tunnel focused and we're looking at results, then servant leadership will become almost non-existent. But at Toyota, what we were taught is that is your job. It's not something different. Servant leadership is your job. If you can't make them successful, you won't be successful. I think some of the aspects of the culture that we were blessed to be a part of in the early days was around the go and see. You know, we've, we think about all the assumptions we make in a day. We think about, we pull from tribal knowledge and, and we've always done it this way. And my, one of my favorite things that I hear from companies is I've seen this before, here's what we need to do. And that's a very lagging comment because it's rework when you hear what the thinking is behind this. I've seen this before. And you know, my first question is how many times have we seen this before? Yeah. And is our reacting going on a reactivity band-aid approach are we actually going to see talk to the process owner and kind of grasp the situation and I think Toyota calls it space to think if we can give people space to think versus the expectation to react because we give the space to react very easily because it looks as if the result is going to be done and I'm going to get what I need by the end of the day. But from a long-term sustainability and growth perspective, not only from a people side, but from the company side, we have to stop to think about what's truly creating this problem. It could be from the machine aspect, from a, the process aspect, from a training aspect. It's, you know, we have to go and see our trainers would always, you know, if we went to them and said, oh, we're getting many of these, they would stop and say, please explain many, I do not understand. Yeah. And at first we didn't think they knew the English, but they knew the English. They were wanting us to get very specific with measuring at the process and understanding that. So, you know, part of the equation walks through the importance of go to see. And it's not just a, hey, a tour, I'm here to say hello. It's what is the purpose behind my Gimba walk and, the, and what I'm doing at the Gimba, I think is differentiating the need for results versus 
versus I should focus on the process. And I think when we look at you know some of the things that we've heard this week about predictabil predictability versus reacting, you know that differentiates if we really truly really spend time to go and see. So I think from the relevancy of the cultural perspective, you know, there's a lot of tools out there and, and people see the tool side of, of lean or any type of um, aspect of, hey, just give me something, let me implement it. Well, when we implement, it's a countermeasure to fix something. And so they see the tool as the, the easy fix. And if we don't, as leaders in the organization, and I'll go as far as saying influencers, you don't have to be a leader to actually influence people. And I think today people feel like if I'm not in that leadership role that I may be hands off or I don't have to deal with that problem. So I like to say influencer quite a bit because if I'm able to influence the thinking behind the tool, you know, if I'm showing someone an A3 report, it's the, it's the after I'm finished report of the thinking that I had to do to give someone my shared wisdom. You know, the A3 is about visualization of my thinking to give to someone to share that wisdom with. And so I think when we, we talk about the relevance of where folks are going today with their, their transitions, their evolution of how they think, I think it's breaking down the thinking and even behind that thinking of the tools that we try to uh, what often comes the flavor of the month and it doesn't stick it doesn't get the stake in the ground because we don't stop and take the time to explain the purpose and I, we see many companies we work across a lot of uh, genres of, of companies and the common theme is the people we don't give them time to understand the purpose of the tool like 5s why are we doing 5s well you know it's a standardization tool why do we need standardization we need to see abnormality from standard at a glance really fast and so to stop give time give that space to think as i mentioned the tools are just a very small portion of it the people and the purpose and the thinking behind the tools if we can get that kind of i talk about planting seeds up here if we can get that fertilize and water that seed every day from a perspective of a development one-on-one -on -one, i think the tool part will kind of go away and it will become intrinsic and that's really the cultural side when it becomes intrinsic people have always said true culture is what you do when somebody isn't looking and that's the intrinsic part i think we felt at toyota we just kind of knew the expectation based on that intrinsic thinking that we knew what the tools were it was the thinking that was important yeah, I also think, uh, think uh, you know, now it's a global economy. So you can't just compete with people in your area, you're competing with people across the world. And, and you take that part related to, you have a shrinking employee pool. And so as, as we continue looking at the development and engagement, you know, how do we keep people working for us? I always, I heard a Zig Ziglar quote a long time ago, and I know it come from other places about, uh, you know, it's better to develop people and lose them than it is not to develop them and keep them. And so what we're talking about is, is how do we get people to, to perform more effectively and efficiently today in order to complete globally. And we have to do that through, we have to be smarter with what we do, but we also have to be more efficient in what we do. So we have to look at every single thing. We always talk about at Toyota, we're thinking about how we save a second, not how do we save 10 minutes, how do we save a second? And then how do we build those seconds? And how do we engage people to find seconds every single day? And as time goes on, we'll build seconds into minutes, minutes into hours, hours into days, days into weeks. And that's how we're able to say, keep the competitive edge of being able to keep people engaged by challenging them. You know, I always heard you get people to start with you because you pay them money, but you keep people by keeping them engaged and keep them in, involved. And then when we go to other companies and we look today, man, that's, that's a struggle for them because they, First, they have a high turnover. A high turnover goes against everything related to culture, right? It's telling you, it's throwing the hand up and saying something's wrong, but we don't have time to slow down. I said, okay, well, when do you have time to do it over? And so we're trying to get them back to the thinking of if we bring people in, develop people to, to be high performers, we can compete more in the global market wherever our, our product needs to go. I think just one last thing to add on that, and I think Toyota did this for me personally and professionally. 
They're always looking at each individual person and developing them past what they thought or I thought I was ever capable, capable of doing. Of that. That's right. And I'm living proof of that um, in, in many ways from a personal side and professional side. And I think if, if people can look at that when I'm coming into an organization to think in five to 10 to 20 years from now, what will I be? That is, that is a futuristic thinker and companies that can foster that, I think, are able to you know, harness those folks in. And instead of selling and telling and convincing people what they should do, we should rather engage, involve, and empower people That's to right. be that way.